So we're going to get in a little bit of an interrogation here, if, if possible. You, um, how can an argument expert not be argumentative? I think it's part of the process that you will be argumentative, but in a way that leads the conversation to a place of positivity and not one that leads it further into negativity. But arguments are just part of the process. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you, what you're really looking to avoid is how to make the um, interaction productive. And, uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm, he what I'm hearing from this, cause I'm a little self-selective possibly, that the negativity is the biggest problem. No doubt. Yeah. Negativity turns it uh, quickly into where you're, what I, what I just call a spiral. I mean, you, you just go into, you start here and then you slowly spiral down to where eventually you don't want to talk to one another. It's a death spiral. Yeah. Um, that sounds a little bit more ser serious, but, but yeah, yeah, it is. Well, you know, I'm a hostage negotiator. I'm going yeah, to think you, of Yeah, that's, tr that's true. It just makes me think of what, like, those alligators do. But, yeah. I <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, very, very true. I mean, you know, the, the alligator. I'm right in the south, though, so you got to, I mean, I, I, we got the swamp right next to us, so I have to relate it to my world. The, oh, are you, you're, you're in D.C.? Is that, is that what you're saying? No, no, no. I'm in the South. So I'm uh, in Southeast Texas, right next to Louisiana. So we see that kind of stuff all the time. Did you, did you run, did you grow up running around chasing alligators in the swamp? Chasing? No, but you would catch them. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're everywhere. All right. So, well, that's, you know, that's a, that first of all, yes. Jefferson Southern name. Yes. Very. Yes. Okay, and so down down in the swamps and the bayous, I mean, you guys, you you look at dinosaurs and creatures that'll kill you, and you're just like, ah, it's the way a New Yorker reacts to pigeons, right? They're just there. That's probably right. I mean, we have you'll you'll see alligators on golf courses and 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 ditches and everything else. And these are dinosaurs, and you guys are used to seeing dinosaurs around that would eat you. Yeah, they don't really want to bother you. No, no, I mean, they, but they have people who hunt them and do all kinds of stuff with them. But anyway, yeah, the death spiral. That's I think that's probably a better term for it. Well, I think there's a lesson there in communication, is there not? Because my guess is you grew up in a very practical environment. Very. Yeah, my 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 father, I'm a fifth generation attorney. So my father's an attorney. I have cousins, uncles. My great grandfather was a federal judge. And so I. My dad would pick me up and I would finish the day sitting in a corner while he was finishing a deposition. So I, I'd, I'd go watch closing arguments when I was in junior high. I mean, this kind of became part of my, my life. So uh, a lot of like, so you don't have, you don't have really um, um, a dog in a fight, a stake in the outcome. Your, your ego is not involved. So you just sitting there, you just paying attention to what works. Yeah, you get to see real quickly what persuades jurors, judges, uh, anybody that's in the room, what what works, what grabs their attention, what turns them off. Yeah, just to be an observer, you you learn a whole lot more. Did your father tell you that that's what he was trying for you to get? Or to me, you strike me as just being very coachable, very open to learning. Well, I'm I'm the oldest. Uh, I'm the oldest of four, so I think it naturally became growing up very quickly, a lot of responsibility very quickly. Uh, no, my, my dad never said, this is what I want for you. I just would pay attention to how he was asking me certain questions uh, and how he would dissect conversations between between the two of us, between with my, my mom or any of my siblings. It was communication was always part of the game in, in my world for, for the better. Yeah. That's, I grew up in a very communication household. It sounds to me like your father was a great listener. I do like the way you ask those kind of questions. Um, the, uh, yeah, but he's, he's, he was a great listener. But a lot of people can ask questions, but for, for him to sort of dissect, if you will, you got to actually be listening. There's, you know, you could pretend you're listening and you could actually be listening. And it sounds to me like he was actually listening. 
He wasn't, that's correct. And he wasn't just listening. He, he was also anticipating where he knew eventually I was, I was wanting to go. So often he would teach me through questions. Very much like law school, you learn with these Socratic method type of learning. So that, that, was, my, that was my daily growing up. So questions, questions are designed to induce thinking first and get an answer second. That would be correct. Yeah, he would ask, he would pose questions when to, to anybody in the audience. Socratic method is a, a way of teaching by instead of telling you something, you're posing a question which makes the listener elicit the answer that they're looking for. And uh, that was the way it, it really went. Now, it wasn't, I, I, I didn't grow up in some kind of weird uh, ecosystem in a vacuum. It was just normal, normal life. But when I, something was happening and I would come, complaining about something. He often had a way of asking the right question that made me find the lesson very quickly. So you developed a fascination with the process at, a, at an early age. It became uh, somewhat of a, I'm not going to say gain, but it became a way of how I would flip words and think of phrases and ways that I would uh, see how certain way you phrase words can affect the impact on somebody, even if it's the same message. So how you phrase words just has a huge impact, no matter what the message was. Well, I, I'm not leery of the word game. Uh, it's, it's like a lot of other things. Um, if you're using it to gain people to, to manipulate, but if game mm -hmm. is to be uh, interested and actually fascinating, I mean, and it, it's not a bad analogy to say, say that life is a game. If you're interested, you want to win with people. Right. Yeah, then it became it very much became a game to me and an interest that I would pick up. I would watch the interactions of others, see if, you know, what different takes that I could have, whatever environment I was I was in. And I, I always always enjoyed it. But my all of the men in my family and women are wonderful storytellers. And so when I would see these big dramatic closing arguments, all the attorneys are packed in, juries full, judges on the bench. You know, these big TV looking moments, you could see really the difference on what would capture somebody's attention and what would turn it off. And I, you, you and I have had a couple of conversations leading up to this. You've been very generous with your time. You've been very gracious with your thoughts. One of the things that you said that really struck me at one point in time was every six seconds counts. Yeah. Every. Yeah, you, you got it. Especially in did the conversation. You that, did you see that in the storytelling that your father would do in front of juries? Well, I, he didn't come up with that phrase, but yes, I, you could tell every six seconds seemed to be the moment when somebody's eyes, like for a juror, would change their eyes to where somebody else is talking, but really they're watching what you're doing. And what you're doing at the, at the council table could really indicate and add context to what the other person is saying. So, for example, if you have somebody who's opposite of you, let's let's assume that you and I are at a, a council table right now. You and I are in a trial and the other side is giving a closing argument. Now, they're listening to that other attorney, but they're watching us. And often they're watching us to see what kind of context clues we give by listening to that other person. So if we cock our head or look at each other and go, that's not that's not right. They They feed on that. Or if it looks like oh, no, I don't like that fact, or I'm scared of that fact, they can tell, oh, that's not good for their case. And so there's a, a lot of different ways that just our nonverbals will communicate whether or not we believe in that message, we're afraid of their message, and what, and what you know, like a, a soundboard, what goes up and down on, on what they need to hear and what's important. Well, they've probably been watching you guys through the entire trial. So by the time that they're getting to the closing arguments, they, pr they got a pretty good feel for when you're reacting genuinely or when you're over exaggerating, you know, if you're acting, I mean, it probably the feel for uh, genuine behavior has probably gotten pretty high at that point in time. Yeah. Depending on how long the trial is, no, no doubt. Uh, there's some jurors who are just, they're, they're, they're out of it. They, they didn't want to be part of the jury, which hopefully you're able to sift those ones out and, and that you don't pick them. Uh, and there's some people that immediately, the, despite what they, they're not supposed to do, they already know what kind of side they're looking for, and they've already made up their mind that this one's the truth teller, this one isn't. A lot of different factors that that go into it. But yeah, it's 
there's, let's say it's a week long trial. You can definitely tell, I mean, juries just with people, as you know, they just have a sixth sense of telling who's being genuine or not. If a witness is on the stand and this person is acting like they're trying to get sympathy at all, uh, they're get just even a hint. They feel like they're being over dramatic. The jury will hate them. I mean, they just, they don't feel like they're genuine. They feel like they're trying to reach for things and they, and they won't like it. Same the other way. If someone's, they think someone's being cold or callous or uh, too invested or too defensive. We see that a lot in um, expert witnesses. So an expert witness is somebody that we hire. Uh, let's say it's accident reconstruction to give testimony on a case. And if you ask a right question to an expert and they buck up against it and get defensive, well, then they look invested and then that can really hurt the other person's case. So that's where kind of ego gets involved. But the jury picks up on all of it and judges do too. Same for court reporters. Right. Yeah. Human beings. I'm, I'm a big believer in human beings instincts when they get yeah. enough data to make up their mind. Oh, yeah. And, and what's funny is in between breaks, the court reporters and the bailiff and the judge are all all talking about your case in, back in judges chambers. I mean, they, they all they all kind of have their vote on how the case is going, what the jury liked, what the jury didn't like. It's, it's a, in many different ways. It's kind of a little theater of some sort, but it's it's very, very um, crucial moments for a lot of the clients. Well, a court reporter can be one of the best sort of sources of data on how you're doing, right? If the court reporter believes that you you got it right, they've been watching oh. a lot of trials. They know they know BS from truth. Oh, they see everything. They they see things that you don't see. If you well, I always treat my court reporters. They're up here. I'm down here. Uh, they are the ones that that rule the rule the land, and they pick on everything that you didn't. And so you always want to be extra kind to them because they, they see things where if you ask some questions, they can give a little more insight to you. But yeah, I mean, human perception is incredibly powerful, especially in the courtroom. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. So for everybody that's watching, if you're if you're not already following Jefferson on Instagram, his Instagram feed, I watch it all the time. I'm always taking something away from it. Uh, the other thing you got a you got a newsletter which uh, I didn't realize till just recently, which I subscribe to. Oh, well, thank you. I, I I love your take on human communication. I love the way you distill things down and declare concise messages. You're also working on a book. I am. Yeah, it's it's a funny world. I mean, you've always been a hero of mine. I mean, it, there's not just many people who have who talk about communication. It's a topic that I love. I know you love. And when I first read your book, I, my immediate thought was like, this guy gets it. Yeah. I love this. I couldn't get, I couldn't get enough of it. Uh, definitely a big fan of the Black Swan Network. Uh, but yeah, I have, a, I have a book that will be releasing about March of next year with Penguin Rain nice. House. Really excited. I just launched my podcast last Tuesday. That's nice. Been a whole lot of fun. And uh, yeah, just a whole lot of, a whole lot of positive blessings for sure. Uh, do we have a title for the book? Yeah, it's called The Next Conversation. Oh, very nice. And yeah, you'll, exactly. you'll have some pre-order links that we'll be able to share with everybody sometime in the near future. Yeah, yeah. I can't. They won't. Um, they have like a whole schedule of when they want me to do it. As you know, like the book world is just a crazy world. Uh, it's it's like anything else I've ever come in contact with. Uh, but yeah, we'll be doing pre-orders here in the next few months or so. Very, very excited about it. Who's your publisher? Uh, so it's Tartar Perigee. They were Avery. So I have the same exact publisher team as uh, James Clear's Atomic Habits. So that exact same team is the one who's who's publishing my book. For, so I'm really, really excited about it. It's their their premier book for 25. So yeah, that's a powerful I, team. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, well, I think it's a message that can really help a lot of people. I'm excited. Yes. Amen. Agreed. And and for everybody that's listening, um, just in, in the last couple years, before Never Split the Difference came out, a friend of mine introduced me to a concept called shuhari, which is martial arts term. And shu is, you know, follow instructions exactly as the master prescribes, you know, wax on, wax off, karate kid, do it exactly what your teacher's telling you. 
Now, as you get better, then you start to look for your training and other masters. And when you see people, other masters, coming across the same ideas that your master is teaching, well, then it's pretty, it's pretty good. It's pretty solid concept. And so when Jefferson's books has come out, everybody that's read Never Split the Difference, listen to what Jefferson has to say. Follow him on Instagram gather up the information, you're going to find that he and I talk about the exact same ideas from different angles. And then you get a chance to look at both and compare them. And that's when you really begin to gain knowledge. So absolutely, when, when Jefferson book come out, you got you got to get a copy. I'm going to get a copy. I'm looking forward to reading it and learning from it. Well, I appreciate that, Chris. That means the world to me, man. Very, very excited. One of these days, we're going to uh, grab some coffee. Gonna come up and see you. Yeah, amen. Or, or or we'll find ourselves in the same place at the same time. You know, maybe yeah. maybe, uh, maybe at a Coldplay concert. I just got back from. I took my girlfriend Wendy to a Coldplay concert. Those are a lot of fun. How was it? I've heard they're amazing. They are. There's a reason Coldplay continues to fill stadiums while other artists are canceling their tours. They are. They make you feel that they're genuinely happy that you're there that night. And there's a lot to be said That's for cool. that. It's just a great community yeah. experience. That's awesome. All right. Very cool.